Who? I'm Kit Morgan. I'm a member of the Groundwater Protection Ordinance Committee here in Tamworth and a member of the Conservation Commission. Our committee is working on a groundwater protection ordinance. Work on it. And uh, we thought it would be helpful for people to learn more about the aquifer, our groundwater, and how to protect it. Uh, um, Rob Newton. I don't need to give you his bio because it's there on the screen. Um, he has a tremendous amount of experience with aquifers, groundwater, uh, both professionally and practical terms. We're going to learn a lot from him tonight. So welcome. Thank you, Kip. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight is is I'm going to talk a little bit about um, and what an aquifer is, how does it form, how do we know how it's laid out and how it's laid out, how does it impact how we need to protect it. Um, so covering some wide areas. Um, and what I want to do is if you if you have any questions, I would like you to just ask them during the talk. And if you're doing it online, you can send it, uh, your questions on chat. Uh, and that should, um, get, they'll get read and we can answer them right at the time. So uh, feel free to ask questions um, anytime during the talk. Okay, so um, I am now a retired professor of uh, geosciences from Smith College. Uh, most of my research was in uh, areas of water rock interactions and how groundwater moves through systems and how that affects the chemistry of the water. Um, but I spent a lot of my career, at least 20 years, and I think it's more like 30 or 35 years, as a member of this Barnes Aquifer Protection Advisory Committee. I want to just say a few words about that because I think it's helpful to towns when they're thinking about making aquifer protection uh, to have a committee like this uh, that will uh, help them um, deal with the issues that come up uh, through time. And the Barnes Act Protection Advisory Committee was actually established by an act of the legislature in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and it had representatives from four communities, the city of Holyoke, the city of Westfield, the city of East Hampton, and the town of Southampton. And they all lie within an aquifer um, and the uh, Barnes Aquifer as it's called uh, is the uh, most important water source in the region. And in fact, it's a sole, designated sole source aquifer for the city of East Hampton. Um, and uh, what the committee did was to um, evaluate projects as they came in um, before they went to the planning board. And so the committee would comment and send their comments to the planning board, who would then have some expertise guiding them in their discussions about the project. Uh, it was purely advisory committee. It had no ability to do anything other than advise. Uh, and it was very successful in protecting the aquifer. Um, it, it has sort of run its course and, and uh, uh, as probably many of you know, that, that groundwater is one of those things that uh, is hard to protect and involves uh, 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 a depletion of the resource through time as more and more people try to use a smaller and smaller resource. And there are a lot of lawsuits that have come forward and um, that has complicated the issue considerably for the Barnes Aquifer. But um, I digress. Let's go forward and see if I can get this to work, which it doesn't want to. That'll work. Okay, so this is a map um, that shows the um, designated aquifers within the town of Tamworth. And you can see most of it is in the south. Um, I can mark on here, I think. Most of the the southwest 
uh, southeast corner, sorry, west, east, one or the other. Um, and uh, it is primarily the areas that are um, covered by a particular set of glacial deposits. Um, the, the sort of the, 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 the seminal work that was done in the area was done in 1995 by Rich Moore and Laura Medali uh, from the US Geological Survey. And they looked at the uh, groundwater resources in the Saco Valley and the Osby River Valley um, in Eastern New Hampshire. And they, you know, they recognized that this represented one of the largest uh, surface aquifers in the state. Uh, and they did a lot of uh, uh, work in delineating the extent of the aquifer and a little bit about how much water might be in it. So that's sort of the basis where we start looking at the aquifer. And this map is the aquifer that uh, they, as they would have designated it. And you see there are different colors um, and those colors refer to, I think we could think of it as, as how much water is there. It's um, essentially uh, a measure, it's measured in the transmissivity of the material. And that's really a measure of how much water you can get out of the ground. Um, and it's uh, technically, it's the hydraulic conductivity, the permeability times the saturated thickness uh, of the material. So think of it as uh, permeability and thickness combined. And we can see that this area uh, from say Silver Lake to, to uh, Osby Lake, and then uh, maybe up to White Lake here represents this, this large area of aquifer uh, here, but there's an arm that extends uh, here to the west into Tamworth. We'll talk a little bit about this arm. Um, so these are, uh, these maps are based on mapping of the uh, glacial sediments. And um, I mapped the Osby Lake Quadrangle in 1970. I think I actually mapped it in 1971. It was published by the state in like 74. Um, and that was a mapping the 15 minute Osby Lake Quadrangle, not the seven and a half minute maps that have come out since then. But the, what, what I want you to know is that this mapping is ongoing and the state of New Hampshire has an active program to complete mapping in this area. Uh, so we can see this is uh, uh, the Mount Chikara Club Quad that Brian Fowler finished in 2018. Um, the, the Sandwich Quad has been done. I'm not sure it's public. I think it is published, yes. Um, and then the, the um, Tamworth down here, the Tamworth Quad, uh, is currently uh, being done by Dan Tinkman. Uh, and uh, there's uh, work being done just to the west by John Brooks. So there's a whole group of people who are trying to complete these maps, and they will be completed within the next uh, uh, year or so. Um, uh, the Osby Lake Quadrangle is a little further off before they, they do that, finish that, but it needs to be redone. Uh, quick question. Can you give us a reference point on that last map just as to where we, what we're looking at? What was the body of water in the middle of that? Are you looking at uh, this one? Yeah. Yeah, so this is this is the Mount Chikara Quad. So this is the summit of Mount Chikara. Okay. Okay. This is Swift River along the tank. Yep. Um, so Tamworth is, is just in the bottom part of the map here. Okay. Great Hill Pond. Yeah, this one. Right. right. Sorry. No, that's all right. I just need a point of reference on that one. All right. So then, if we're going to talk about aquifers, we're going to have to know what is an aquifer. Does anybody have an idea what an aquifer is? Shout it out. <laughs> yeah. So. so we find soil. It's like sand. Yes. Now, the technical definition is much more ambiguous than that. It's simply any geologic material from which usable quantities of water can be extracted. Well, that's almost any. Because if you have an old farmhouse, there's probably a dug well in the back 
um, that uh, might have been dug in uh, glacial till, which isn't a very good aquifer, but they got water out of it. So, hey, they've defined an aquifer. Um, so an aquifer is any material which we can get useful quantities for. But we tend to think about the aquifers are, the, are, the, are those um, units that have a lot of water, that a lot of people can easily get water out of the ground. So um, that's what we're going to tend to be talking about. But technically, there's an aquifer every place there's a well, because people are getting usable quantities of water out of the ground. All right, so um, in the aquifer mapping that was done by the US Geological Survey, what they were probably going on was where the uh, deposits, what's called stratified drift. And that term stratified drift, you can, you can say is equal to sand and gravel. Um, and it's just deposits that were laid down by meltwater or rivers, not directly by the ice, but by rivers. But the, the rivers, there were so many rivers around because the ice had uh, melted, it was melting. And so you had huge amounts of water and the glaciers were really effective at eroding. So they produced lots of sediment and the rivers sorted that sediment. And we have these deposits. We've all seen these deposits in the, in the gravel pits. And we see layers um, of gravel, layers of sand, and each individual layer is pretty well sorted. Um, and because it's well sorted, then there's more space between the grains. So you, you see in this little uh, diagram that if you had a, a, a well sorted sediment that you tend to get big pore spaces between the individual grains, whether they be gravel or sand size. Whereas a poorly sorted sediment, um, you have finer grain material filling in the spaces between the coarser material. So anytime you have well sorted material, you're going to have more water being stored. And if it's coarse enough, then that water will be able to move through those pores. And you know, here's an aquifer in formation. So we see this, uh, the, these, uh, this river, and it is a meltwater stream, as you'll see in a moment. Um, and it's transporting this material, leaving behind it. You can see it's filled the valley. It's kind of flat floored, lots of coarse gravel being deposited. And if we just turn around 180 degrees, look the other direction, uh, we'll see there's a glacier sitting here. And this is the meltwater coming out of the glacier. Meltwater and sediment sorted. This is uh, creating this outwash. Uh, and this would be an outwash plain, outwash deposit, um, which we find many of these in the area. And these are the aquifers uh, because they're sorted, uh, coarse grained, um, and thick. And so they, they make great aquifers. Doesn't all have to be gravel, sand sized material. This is uh, uh, in the local area here, a nice, well sorted sand. Um, with some interesting structures that tell us which way the water was flowing. Interesting, I think this is a digression, but what the hell. Um, this tells us that the water's flowing from left to right, uh, going that way. And that, interestingly enough, is uphill. So water here was flowing uphill. How can water flow uphill? Well, this was in a tunnel underneath the ice, so like a pipe. And so it's moving uphill. Of course, it's down the hydraulic gradient, but um, it's actually moving uphill. So we see lots of this well-sorted sediment around that tells us uh, that this is going to be, this is, the, this is what our aquifers are. They look like this. Now, there, of course, there are other aquifers, um, and we do have um, fractures in the rock. And this is an example right after a huge, actually a hurricane uh, worth of rain. Um, and you see water running through those fractures. And of course, if you have a well in bedrock around here, you're getting your water from these fractures. Um, so there's no, there's no intergranular spaces. It's all fracture spaces. Um, and then finally, the last kind of material that makes up aquifers around here is this 
glacial till, it's called glacial till, it's the material that was deposited directly by the ice. And it's unsorted, unstratified. So it doesn't have a lot of porous bases in it, but in uh, some cases it's pretty sandy, doesn't have a lot of fines and it can make a, a, a very reasonable aquifer uh, in, in many cases. But we're gonna talk tonight primarily about the stratified drift aquifer. And this is a section of the Ospie Lake 15 minute quadrangle that I mapped in 1974. Uh, and here is that the yellow shows this big outwash plane. Um, and the ice was standing about halfway down uh, Silver Lake. And it was very much like that picture that we just looked at uh, of the glacier in Alaska. Uh, uh, with a big meltwater stream coming out the other end. And this, this is what happened here. Um, and so this material was all deposited in that way. So this is a view of the landscape here. And, and I'm using, I've created these uh, views of the landscape using, so these are really digital elevation models. They're models of the landscape that are done using a brand new data set, um, this LIDAR data um, that the state of New Hampshire has collected. There's now LIDAR data for the entire state. And it essentially gives you an elevation um, of the land surface every two and a half feet on the land surface. So lay out a grid on the land surface and every two and a half feet, we have an elevation. And it's done by an airplane flying over the landscape, shooting a laser beam down and timing how long it takes for the beam to come back. Um, it actually measures lots of things about the, the canopy, the forest canopy, but some light gets through to the forest floor, comes back and you get an elevation from that. The elevations are good to within about a foot um, or even a little better than that if it's in the open, a little worse than that if you're in the forest. And the spacing can be actually, the actual measurements might be more than two and a half feet in the forest, but uh, in the open, um, it's, it's really, really accurate. So it's giving us a view of the landscape we've never had before. Throw away all your topographic maps. You don't need them. You're just gonna use LIDAR and digital elevation models. And in fact, the fascinating thing in this is if you look, so this is Silver Lake, this is White Lake, Moore's Pond, um, if you look in this area here, you can see the stream channels from the meltwater streams that were flowing when the ice was standing right here. Oh my God, you can see it. It's unbelievable. Um, so this is a whole new light data set that allows us to get a much better view of the landscape, which gives us a much better interpretation about where the aquifers are and how they're built. Um, so this is uh, that portion that we now know must be a significant aquifer. And it lies with the town of Madison, Tamworth, Ossipee, and Freedom. Maybe this is why I think you should be thinking about a Barnes Aquifer Protection Advisory Committee like uh, the one, because it, it would enhance the cooperation between different uh, towns to make sure that everybody has a protected water supply. And this is just an overlay of the, um, the uh, Moore and Medali Act for Interpretation showing that yes, indeed, there's a lot of water here. Okay, so that's sort of first part, getting an idea of what the aquifers are. Let's talk a little bit about groundwater flow, just briefly, and we'll come back to this in a minute. Um, but um, if we think of the landscape as being made up of, uh, let's just say it's all sand. It's all what we call stratified, it's all sand. Um, and rain comes down and, and it infiltrates down through the sand um, and eventually it gets down and, and fills all the pore spaces here. So this is saturated. Every pore space is completely filled with water. Up here, there's a little bit of water up there in the pore spaces for the trees to use, but um, most of the pore space is empty. 
So we have an unsaturated zone, saturated zone, and water in the saturated zone is moving. So the groundwater is always moving, um, and it's moving towards the surface water. So there's a direct connection between the groundwater and the surface water. And in this case, it's a river. And of course, we know this because uh, if we go out to the rivers today, uh, go outside and look at the Swift River out here, there'll be water flowing through the river and it may not have, well, of course it's been raining for a lot. But if you come out here after a month of no rain, there's still water flowing in the river. Well, where's that water coming from? It's coming from the groundwater. So the groundwater is feeding the base flow of the rivers. So water's entering the system here from these high areas and it's leaving the system and in, this is surface water. So into the streams and into the lakes. So there's a direct connection between these two things. So groundwater is moving, it's being recharged in some areas and being discharged in other areas. So I'm gonna to try to emphasize that recharge is the critical area. Protecting recharge areas is absolutely critical because that's where water enters the system and it's the area where you're gonna be most susceptible to contamination. Discharge areas, not so much if you're just caring about the, the, the groundwater. Care about surface water, well, that's maybe a little different. But, but groundwater is gonna move through the system from high areas of recharge to low areas of discharge. All right, well, back to the geology a little bit, uh, back to Alaska, great place to go. Um, of course, these glaciers are way back from where they used to be. This is the Bendenhall Glacier. Um, and uh, oftentimes we see lakes, right? The, this is a glacial lake because one shoreline is the glacier. So glacier lakes are very common and they were very common in New England as the ice retreated. You know, we think we have a lot of lakes now. Well, there were probably five times the amount of surface area of water as the glaciers were retreating. So um, glacial lakes were very common. And glacial lakes um, have stratified, sorted layers, but they tend to be, of course, much finer grain. We know that. The lake sediments are going to be fine grain. The cool thing about the lake sediments, again, a little digression, but hey, geology is fun, um, is that if you look at these lake sediments in these glacial lakes, they have this alternation between a clay layer that forms in the lake in the winter when it's frozen over, and you just have suspended sediment in the water column that's falling out on the bottom. And then the summer you get uh, coarser sediment where all the meltwater streams are pouring into the lake. And so you get sand on the bottom, little fine grain sand, silky sand. So you have summer layer, winter layer. And so, well, that's one year, that's next year. And if you're interested in climate, you can look at, well, this was a really warm summer. This was, there was hardly any thing happening this summer. You can climate records, but anyways, it's, it's like this. And, but this does not make a good aquifer. Okay, so not a good aquifer because it's too fine grain and it's too hard. There's too much friction for water moving through it. Okay, so now we're gonna talk, I'm just gonna tell a little story essentially, a little sedimentation model of how glaciers uh, deposit aquifers that are different in different places. And so this is a little diagram. We've got a glacier and a glacial lake, just like that picture of the Mendenhall Glacier just a minute ago. And let's imagine that the ice front is here. And when the ice front is here, there's meltwater coming. Am I staying close enough? Oh, question. Yes, go ahead. So um, David Little asked, water moves from higher areas of recharge to low levels of discharge. Why not to high levels of discharge? Because it's gravity. It's because uh, water always flows downhill. So wherever it starts, it's going to end someplace lower. Okay, so that might, you know, um, Lake of the Clouds, and uh, I'm not watching a bad example, but 
you know, there's water, there's groundwater discharging into that. It's the low area of discharge, even though it's up at 5,000 or something. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, relatively, it's always going to go downhill because it's being driven by gravity. Okay, so we've got the ice front here and meltwater's coming out from the ice, usually underneath it. We saw that that example that I said, the water is flowing uphill because it's under pressure. Uh, it can flow out underneath the glacier. So that's happening, it's carrying sediment. And so it's dumping coarse, sorted sands and gravels right at the bottom. And it, the ice is here. Well, it mounts back to here and it's laying down an apron of this, this uh, orange colored coarse sediment. And as it melts back, say so when it gets back to here, of course, you're not getting that coarse sediment being deposited over here. Instead, you're just getting those clays, those bar clays, the silt and clay being deposited on top of that stuff from the glacial lake. And of course, if the glacier pauses in its retreat, if it melts back but stops melting back for a while, then the pile of sediment gets thicker. And if it sits there long enough, it will build up this, uh, this delta feature where the meltwater comes off the ice into the, into the lake. And so it'll be all the way up to here. And then of course the ice will start to melting back again. Uh, it's now way out here out of the picture. And we have this delta abandon, but it's higher than the lake level. Uh, and we have all this, uh, clay being deposited on top of these sands and gravels. But, and this is sort of critical, um, the, once it's all the ice is gone, um, we have an uh, aquifer developed and we could have a great aquifer here underneath this lake sediment but it would only be recharged where the aquifer material is exposed to the surface. So this is our high area of recharge. Oh, and here's a little river here. So that's a low area of discharge. Um, you use the cursor to show so people. Oh, I'm sorry. I've I've fallen out of out of the uh, my area. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. So here's the area of recharge. Here's the area of discharge. The river. It's um, blue arrow showing the direction of flow. And because this lake sediment is sitting on top of the aquifer materials here, the only place it can get recharged is in this primary recharge area, where the sand and gravel is exposed at the surface. So this is, this is the critical area. Question. Yeah. So someone, I'm not sure who, is asking, are you saying that the surface water in the ponds and lakes that exist today never moves toward groundwater because the lake or pond sediment is too fine to allow water to permeate through it? No. <laughs> that was a loaded question. That's a that's a loaded question. Um, hmm. um, that's a really good question. That's an exceptionally good question. Uh, I'm actually very happy that question was asked, but I'm not going to answer it right now. But Kit is going to make sure that I do answer it before I'm done. So someone else has a question, Bob has a question about a well. He's concerned about homes being built on built. I'm wondering if um, if the the home is at the 700 foot altitude and the new properties are being built at 900 feet or the new wells. Well, possibly. Um, but the question is, you know, there are two ways of thinking about this question. One is, will it impact the water quality in my well? Someone builds a house uphill from me, 
And let's say we're in this, we're not in a stratified drift aquifer, we say we're in the glacial till mm -hmm. aquifer, which doesn't have a lot of water in it to begin with. And they build their house uphill from me, will they impact my water quality? And the answer is possibly, um, because if they have a septic tank, then the effluent from the septic tank potentially could impact the quality of groundwater. But dilution is the solution to pollution. So if there's lots of groundwater and just one small leach field, no, it's not gonna have a significant impact. If they build a hundred houses and it's a small aquifer, then maybe, you know, maybe you'll start to see nitrates go up. Probably won't see bacteria because the bacteria is effectively removed by going through the, the pores. Uh, they're so small that it filters out the bacteria really effectively. So, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of a loaded question. Um, and one that really depends on the scale of the situation. Will it impact the amount of water? And again, it's the same answer. It depends. If it's one house, no, it's not going to have any impact uh, because there's a lot of water compared to how much is being drawn and new water is always coming into the system, except if we have a drought, um, but uh, unlikely to be a big impact unless there are a lot of houses. So I don't know if that's a good answer or not. Um, a follow-up to that question, if, if those that very scenario with two houses, one at a higher elevation than the other, and let's say they both have drilled wells that are going down into bedrock, um, same kind of scenario would, would, you know, like the discharge from a septic system find its way down and contaminate the lower elevation wells or, or are we too deep to, I, I know it's a, more of a geologic question, but. Well, so, so it becomes more difficult because, it, you know, there are all kinds of regulations about where you can put your leach field and how you build your leach field to prevent your leach field from sitting right on the rock because um, contaminants can move through the fractures in the rock. And the fractures in the rock aren't really great about removing bacteria um, because they're too big. Uh, so mm, it's, that's a different story. Yeah. Th these, are, these are tough questions. Mm -hmm. but really require site-specific analysis. Um, who's next? I haven't, thought, I haven't forgotten about the seepage lake question. One of my favorites. Hearing no more questions, I'm gonna move forward uh, with a quiz. You thought you didn't have to take a quiz, but um, it's not really a quiz. But here's here's a situation. We should now understand how this occurred. <clears throat> that this sediment was deposited. This sediment was deposited when the ice front was moving back, and it's relatively thin. The ice front paused here. Got a big mound of this aquifer developed, and it's higher than the lake level. And clay was deposited here. Uh, so that makes perfect sense, I think, now. We see this happening. And then once we understand this, we realize that the aquifer may be here, but this is the recharge area. That's what we need to really concentrate and protect. Because that is where the, the, the issues really are. If you, if you located a, uh, a toxic waste or if you dumped toxic waste on the ground right here, would it contaminate this well? Well, it could. I'm gonna, I'll put that question up for just a moment. Um, but this well, you know, someone drilled their well here, or dug their well here, and they didn't hit any water. They dug a well here, and there was no water until they broke through into the aquifer, at which point the water rose in their well to this level. Over here, they didn't hit any clay. They just dug down and they hit water right there. And that was where the water table was. So this is the saturated zone. This is the unsaturated zone. Um, 
once you get into the clay, it's a little different because this line here doesn't represent the boundary between the saturated zone and the unsaturated zone. Instead, it just marks the height to which water would rise in a well if you were to put a well in here. Is that the hydrostatic pressure? Yeah, it's due to, you can think of it as that the water here is under pressure and it rises to that height. And sometimes this potentiometric surface is actually above the ground level. So when you drill this well, it's dry until you get here and then water comes out of the well. You don't need to pump. So it's a flowing well. And flowing wells are pretty common in, in uh, New England. Here's an example of one that um, I actually drilled. A, this was, a, this was an uh, observation well, and I drilled a hole in the cap. Um, and uh, so for, well, it's oh, maybe 25 years now, water's been spraying up through the well. Um, the reason why we like to put a hole in it is that if you don't, you don't have water flowing in your well, you'll get a lot of slime and things forming in it and you don't get good connection to the aquifer anymore. And we were interested in continuing the sample. So this has been flowing for like 25 years. Now, actually now the water level is about here. It's um, local. No, it's not in this local area. Um, so, but we understand why this is happening now. Okay, high area of recharge. Um, and then we have these lake sediments. Okay, so why do we want to be so ambitious as to try to pass a zoning ordinance to protect our groundwater? That's because it's easy to lose it. And not only is it easy to lose, you lose it for a long time. Now, you can treat it. Okay? gets contaminated, but it's very expensive. So I'm gonna tell you a little story about the Barnes Aquifer. Um, and this is a situation where trichloroethylene contaminated the aquifer, unknown for years and years. Um, but eventually the trichloroethylene was detected in a well way up here. Um, and after years of study, the state was never able to determine where it came from. The state was never able to determine where it came from. Um, cost the city of East Hampton a lot of money because they had to build a treatment plant. Um, the water department people in the individual towns, they figured it out. <laughs> um, there was no industry using TCE in the area, but there was in Holyoke, a General Electric facility, a transformer facility um, that was the transformers had TCE in the oil, or they used they used it TCE to clean the oil, the transformers after they drained the oil, and they created all the sand that was contaminated with TCE, and they dumped it. Actually, they got their employee, they gave it to their employees who dumped it into some old sand and gravel pits over here. Notice the scale on this map. I'm sorry, I did it again. Notice the scale on this map. Here we are here. Uh, so we're talking about some sand and gravel pits in this area where the TCE contaminated sand was dumped. Um, and it eventually migrated to the north here, um, contaminating all these wells. This is uh, the city of Holyoke. This is the city of Westfield. This is the town of Southampton. This is the city of East Hampton. Everybody had contamination in here. Um, and there were a mixture of municipal water supply wells and individual homeowner wells um, that were all contaminated. Oops, wrong way. So um, once we figured it out, we actually did a, a, a model, a mathematical model of how the contamination moved through the aquifer through time. 
And so here's our source. These are our plumes. There were two potential sources here. Uh, this was our plume. Uh, and uh, after five years, it had moved. Uh, this, is our, this is our plume. Um, there were two sources there and there. And after five years, it had moved to here. Okay, so not very far. The right way. 10 years, you can see it's moved a little bit further. 25 years, 50 years, now it's into East Hampton. Mm -hmm. East Hampton has to um, build a treatment facility to remove TCE from the water supply. Um, and in 75 years, it'll be there. So the bottom line is groundwater moves slowly. Contamination isn't noticed until long after the sources of contamination have been, are gone. Uh, good question again. Um, with, with that, that particular scenario, at the source that I'm assuming that the concentration of that contamination has reduced over time? Yes. And so, uh, in fact, uh, in East Hampton now, the contamination is uh, right about at the MCL, which is the maximum contaminant level that EPA allows. Uh, but EPA will never let the city stop running their treatment facility. Right. Just too risky. Um, so. After how many years did you say the well, was detected and they figured out the source? It was detected in 1980 something, um, and it was contaminated in the early 1950s. And it was just people dumping sand into an old sand pit. Has the sand been removed? Or no, it has removed? not. No, because there's no one to pay for that. So it's, it's a, it's a, and, and the other thing is that there were many people who didn't know their drinking water was contaminated in the private homes. And so uh, I have a lab that can do this kind of analysis. And I, I offered anyone that I would do the analysis free of charge for them. They wouldn't do it. Why wouldn't they do it? Why do they not want to know? It's the cost of money. The property values go. Pfft. So um, we actually, they pack got uh, uh, local ordinances passed that if a house uh, is sold, there has to be a analysis of TCE if there's a if there's a, a a private well. So these are the kinds of issues, and I, I can't emphasize enough. This is not uncommon. This is a typical scenario. The sources are a long time before you find out where they came from. Um, so you need to be, you need to be protection, protect now. I mean, we know so much more now than we did in the 1950s. Okay, so let's, um, let's try to uh, quickly uh, finish up. And I, I, um, I want to look a little bit about the, this part of the Tamworth Aquifer. That is, um, in the southern part here, this arm that goes off uh, from the big outwash plain. Uh, so we'll look at that a little bit. Um, you know, here's the digital elevation model, and you can see from the landscape, you see these flat, high-level surfaces, and even here you see old stream channels. Um, on this area here. And, and then you have these low areas. And so now we recognize that these high flat areas are areas that are going to be recharge areas. These are gonna be principal recharge areas where the flat areas down along the river are not going to be so important for, for recharge. Um, so we're zooming in um, and I, so Route 25 is just off to the south. This is the Brett School here. Uh, old gravel pit right here, I think. Yes. 
That's just my interpretation from looking at the LIDAR. Um, and so, you know, that, that there is a long history in New England, a very long history of this being done time and time and time again. Here's a hole in the ground. Let's fill it in. Let's put stuff in it. Uh, let's turn it into a landfill. Um, we've already excavated it. Perfect place for landfill. Is it a perfect place for the landfill? Primary recharge area. Probably not. So this is the kind of area you want to uh, protect. Now, I must admit, I didn't know anything about landfills in Tamworth, but this is an old landfill. Or not that old, I don't know when it was, but the LIDAR clearly shows that this is a landfill probably in an old gravel pit. Um, so this is what you want to avoid. This is why you want to have um, some uh, agro-protection legislation, prevent this from happening. Um, around here, I'm sure that most of these people, I know there's a municipal water system here in the center of town, but I don't think there's one out here. I don't know what the school does for their water, but you know, they're less than a thousand feet away from here. This is not some, this is not an ideal situation. This is, this is what you strive to avoid. And, and what we know today is that this, this, this can be avoided. This is just the air photo. Um, so here's the um, landfill, there's the school. Um, the gravel pit looks like it's pretty old, overgrown, not active. This is the aquifer map. So it's it's in the aquifer. It's mapped aquifer. That's what it is. And and you know this is this is the situation again. I keep coming back on this, um, but here it's a little different scenario than the one I gave you before. But it's essentially the same thing. You have these. You have this terrace uh, next to the um, the, the uh, valley wall. And this is where the primary recharge occurs. If you were to look at the water table, it comes down like this. There's lots of space here to store water after a rain event. And when you get down next to the stream down here, you're in the heart of the aquifer, but you don't get much recharge there. Um, and so anything you do here, um, you know, if you were to have a spill of something right there, well, it's gonna get into the river, but it's not gonna get into the groundwater. The groundwater is actually flowing upward there. Um, so you're not going to you're not going to contaminate the groundwater. You're going to contaminate surface water. So protection needs to be back here in this area here. And then there, we can talk about secondary recharge areas, which are the slopes where you don't have a big aquifer area, but but it's still runoff is coming down here. If you look at the slopes around here next to these uh, terraces, you'll often find wetlands here where you come between the two, the water's running down here um, and it saturates essentially the aquifer here, the water table comes to the surface. It actually provides storage of water that then is infiltrated down um, and uh, gets into the system. So again, there are some areas that are much more important. You know, it might be daunting when you first look at the map and say, look at all this area of Africa. You do the whole thing? Well, maybe you don't have to do the whole thing. I would say if you're unsure, do the whole thing, but then as time goes on, you may be able to define certain areas that are more important than other areas. There's a question. You know, the primary feature areas always show up on the map as being part of the aquifer. They're not, they're never outside of that area. So, so they should always be part of the aquifer. But and uh, I was going to point it out, but I didn't. Uh, if you look at the Moore and Medali map in 1995, it misses some of the aquifers that are in Tamworth um, because it wasn't mapped very well, which is why this mapping program that's going on by the state right now is so important because it's you, number one, we now have this new tool, the LIDAR data that's of tremendous help to the people doing the map. Uh, they'll get it, they'll get be much higher quality maps because of that. Um, and then that's why they're 
they're redoing the Osby Lake 15 minute quadrangle because <laughs> the guy who did that didn't know what he was doing. It was back in 1974. I didn't have any idea what I was doing. Um, so so it, it should be, but it may not. All right, so now I'm going to go to the question. Maybe my, and I think this will work. Yes. Let's talk about lakes. And, and I'd like to talk about seepage lakes. And a seepage lake does not have an outlet stream. And I would argue White Lake is a seepage lake. I mean, I think sometimes water gets out of there, overflows a little bit, but basically there's a stream that comes in, but there's nothing goes out. So where does the water go? Well, it's got to go out as out seepage. So there are places in the lake where water comes in, where groundwater enters the lake, and there are places where groundwater exits the lake. <clears throat> and you could think of these lakes, these seepage lakes, as being giant, large diameter wells. Okay, so there's water coming in one side. Well, you know, in a well, water's passing through the well on its merry way. And that's just what's happening in these lakes. So I will digress for just a moment and say that one of the things I did in my early part of my, well, in my early part of my career was I was looking at impacts of acid rain on lakes. And we came up with this really cool computer model that simulated all the groundwater flow, all the surface water flow, all the biological property processes in the lake, all the properties going on in the watershed, uh, respiration, root respiration, we did everything. And we came up with a, with a great story about why some lakes were sensitive to acidification and others were not. And essentially the story was, hey, if there was groundwater going through the system, the lakes were neutral. Because groundwater takes so long to go through the aquifer, that it has time, those acids have time to react with the minerals and they become neutralized. So we could classify lakes and determine whether they were sensitive enough. We did this all over the world. Um, EPA hired us to do the, uh, all the work for the reauthorization of the Clean Air Act in 1990. Um, and all right, this is cool. Seepage lakes, should seepage lakes be Acid lakes or neutral lakes? They should be neutral. They're going to all be neutral. So, well, we bought a test and sample a few just to find out, make sure we're right. First seepage lake we went to, it was the most acidic lake we'd ever seen. What the hell? Um, and I could tell interesting stories about the chemistry, but you don't want to hear that. Um, but, mm, not that. But, do this. No. Oh my God. I screwed it up. So I have the wrong, I have the damn wrong map. Diagram, damn it. All right, well anyways. I'll, I'll explain what happens. So in some lakes, what happens is that, oh, lake sediments accumulate in the bottom of the lake. Those lake sediments are mucky, organic -y stuff, right? And they clog up the connection to the groundwater. And what happens when that occurs? Well, water can't get out of the lake. Water doesn't come into the lake. The only way water can get into the lake is by direct rainfall. It's like having a bucket out. And in fact, the lakes start to get higher and higher. They, and in time, they get higher and higher and higher. And some of these lakes were in deep basins that might be 20, 30 feet to the water level. But in time, they've climbed out of their kettle holes, the holes they're climbing out of them uh, as lake sediment accumulates in them. Um, and thus, the ones that are acidic are acidic because they're isolated from the groundwater by the sediment. That accumulates in. Um, so 
lakes. This water comes in, water goes out. Um, I think actually Silver Lake is one of those cases where there's water coming out of Silver Lake directly into the Ospi Aquifer. Um, whereas other places, the lakes become isolated um, and are just big buckets collecting rain. Yeah. So I thought when you were going to talk, crap enough to talk about out seepage, you were going to talk about uh, mountain streams that flow pretty well and they come down and they hit the floodplain of either the Bear Camp or the Saco and they don't make it to the river. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that, and I, maybe I can go back. Uh, so that's the, that, that is uh, this, there's lots of great examples. Um, if we go back to this one, so you're, what we see is that the rivers coming down here, um, once they, they're flowing on material that doesn't absorb water, it doesn't infiltrate because it's either glacial till or it's a bedrock itself. So they're coming down and then they hit this thick sand and gravel um, and then they all start infiltrating. So um, alluvial fans form where rivers come down out of the mountains into the valleys. And those alluvial fans uh, will suck up water during the summer so that the rivers often don't make it in. So yeah, that's a very, that's a very common thing. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one question, Bob. What's, is there a difference between that, that seepage pond or seepage lake that you had in the diagram and a kettle pond, or are they similar? The same. Okay. So kettle ponds are, are a, a kettle hole is a, a ice block that was buried in the sand and gravel deposits from the meltwater streams. And so it was buried. Um, and then uh, eventually after the meltwater streams dried up because the glacier was gone, then that buried ice eventually melts mm -hmm. and the land surface collapses and gives you a hole. Are the bottom of those uh, more um, retard, recharged type materials or is it more like clay layers and, and muck? No, they start out being nice sand and gravel, but if the, if they intercepted the water table, then they were flooded. So they're now a kettle pond. Mm -hmm. And if there's a lot of organic activity, uh, algae and things growing in the water, then that's all going to fall to the bottom. And you're going to get this mud that, that isolates that pond. So that's why a lot of those, some of the kettle ponds don't have a lot of wildlife in them. Some of them are really acidic. You know, next question. pH of 4.3. So there's a question on Zoom. Does the Ossipi Aquifer flow toward the town of Tamar or away from it? Yeah. <laughs> so both. <laughs> flow directions are not uniform over large areas. So there's a river that goes through the center of town. The flow is towards the river. The river is the point of discharge for the groundwater. Now, there may be deeper circulation, but I think that covers 90% of all the groundwater or more. So yes. if we have if we have areas, let's say in, in Ossipi Valley, which is like West Ossipi down to Center Ossipi, and the Veracap River is, you know, the example that I'm using because we all know it, that generally speaking, everything's flowing towards the river in a general sense. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then uh there's the uh West Branch coming out of Silver Lake, okay. and the Bear Camp is so they sort of go parallel. So on one side, the, you know, when you're closer to the West Branch, it's going towards the West Branch. When you're closer to the Bear Camp, it's going towards the Bear Camp. Even and there's a divide, there's a groundwater divide between those two. Even though there may not be a topography, topography, topographic high point between the two. Yeah, well, the, usually there is, but, but there's, a, there's a groundwater divide. That I didn't understand. Yeah, so there are lots of groundwater divides. 
Are you giving the same or a different talk tomorrow at uh, one of the calls? Different. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. When you were talking about glaciation uh, ending the center of Silver Lake, is that total glaciation or just one event that caused uh, all those deposits to occur? Yeah. So the glacier, of course, extended all the way down to Long Island. Um, and then it was retreating back. And for a very brief period of time, it, it, the ice front was located between, say, Hurricane Point across to Allegro Pines, if you know anything about Silver Lake, halfway across the lake, halfway through the lake. You see those streams, and they come up and they stop, and the land drops down. That's where the ice On the TCE question, did that material get moved primarily through surface water? No, it was all groundwater flow. Is it soluble in water? Or does yeah. Does it evaporate? Doesn't it? It does evaporate, yeah. but it was dumped in a sand pit and buried in sand, so it didn't evaporate. No, it was flushed down into with the water, with the recharge water that went through that. Does it stay on the surface of the groundwater? Um, no. It will, it will dissolve into it. Not like oil, which would say. Oil would tend to, although even oil dissolves partially. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, most of it stays, most of them are floaters and that is, you know, if you're thinking about gasoline and oil, most of the constituents there tend to float, but a, a significant portion sink. Because you got to remember that those things are not single compacts. Trichloroethylene is, but it's but like gasoline and oil are not. Can you comment on the, the possible threat to the groundwater of uh, stormwater, you know, storm events and runoff? And uh, it it's all depends on what's in the stormwater. And uh, so you could think of, well, okay, if the stormwater was draining something where there was a, 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 a truck rolled over, a septic tank draining truck rolled over on the road and spilled its contents on the road, and then it rained, and that stormwater went and infiltrated into the ground, okay? There wouldn't be any real impact on the groundwater because the groundwater is really, really good at taking those or the, those bacteria out of the system, filtering them out. It's like going through a sand pit. Um, but if it were a, a chemical truck, then and it infiltrated, that would be a, a terrible thing because it would go into the groundwater. Um, so it depends what it is. Depends whether it infiltrates. Does the stormwater eventually infiltrate, or does it go to surface water? If you run all your surface, all your stormwater into the rivers, well, it's not going to go into the groundwater because the rivers are points of groundwater discharge. So it depends what it is, and it depends where it goes, and how much infiltrates. I have one more kind of unrelated question. Sometimes during the year, I'm on a well. Obviously, it's a shallow well. I'm on a, close to the Bear Camp River. It's only a 22 foot well. The water's a little high in iron and mang manganese. manganese. Yeah. Sometimes during the year, um, it seems like the sulfur content increases. It has that, that smell to it. Yeah. What causes that? It's your hot water heater. Seriously. Yeah. So it's the sulfur reducing bacteria living in your hot water heater. Give your well a shot of uh, Clorox. Why at certain times of the year? Because my consumption rate is almost like Yeah, I can't say that. It it but it but you know there's not a source of reduced sulfur unless it's a, a unless there's a, a bog or something nearby. Uh, but generally around here, there isn't, there aren't sources of reduced sulfur in the rocks. Like some places there are, yeah. but not around here. 
Um, we don't have those kinds of rocks. <clears throat> so, you know, it's, it's most likely that the sulfur reducing bacteria are doing that in your hot water heater because it's got a, it's the right temperature for them to, to live. And the remedy is? Clorox. In... I shouldn't say that. No, in the, in the well or? Yeah. yeah, it is poured in the well. Okay. Yeah. Follow up on uh, Kit comment. Um, so a stormwater management um, takes the stormwater and slows it down so you don't have erosion and setting control going into the, to the surface waters to improve that. But by having detention facilities and retention facilities, there's going to be more groundwater infiltration. So it's actually going to make the groundwater um, slightly worse. Than if if there's bad stuff in the stormwater. Which there is coming off the roads. And if it's coming off roads, it's going to be mainly salt. You know, salt is the big thing. Yep. Um, and yeah, any, anything they infiltrate will, you know, one of the big problems, the biggest problem water quality wise across the whole area is the salt concentration in the groundwater is going up. It's not much of a problem right now, but it's going to be one soon. And when that happens, I don't know what you're going to do. Yeah. yeah, case in point is freshman brook, which flows into uh, White Lake. I mean, what, yeah, White Pond, White Lake. No, White Pond, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that that's that's a that's a big issue, and that's a stormwater issue, in in the sense that um, you know a lot of that runoff water is is infiltrated, maybe just off the sides of the road. Um, but that's it, it's troubling because I've been monitoring salt in the groundwater for a long time, and it's going up. Yeah, we have a uh, soil in the basement that we keep uh, a bowl of water. We take yeah. Out mm -hmm. of the system and it evaporates and you get these white deposits around the top of the air. That's probably calcium sulfate. No, no salt. Yeah, it could be calcium sulfate. Yeah, I think it's most likely to be calcium sulfate. I mean, I suppose if you had a lot of salt in your water, that would be true. You tend to get a lot of the sulfate is a major component of the water, other than bicarbonate here, um, and calcium is the major cation, and calcium sulfate gives you a white precipitate. Mm -hmm. The thing was, it never happened. Well, here's the here's the way you find the answer. If you just rinse it out, if it's salt, it's gone. If you if it doesn't just come off with rinsing, then it's calcium sulfate because mm -hmm. salt is very soluble. Yeah. Um, the Eaton Planning Board, we're looking at uh, groundwater recharge ordinance, the groundwater protection ordinance. Is there a way for us to identify primary recharge areas uh, using LIDAR maps or anything else? Um, I think uh, you should uh, ask for help from the DES because um, I think. I don't know where Eaton is on the mapping schedule, um, but uh, the certainly the the people doing the mapping today, uh, Dan Tinkham, John Brooks are both groundwater people. Uh, they have the the um, expertise to do that as part of their mapping. Um, so I think you could ask the state geologist's office for the, tell them you were, you're looking for that because you understand that they're remapping this area. And this would be something that would be very useful to you. They're looking for ways to make their maps more useful to you. So I think you should take advantage of that. Well, that, that, that would help them to define their, their protection district, so to speak, within the town? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think having more protection districts rather than less is a good thing, but to understand that um, 
there are not all places need are as critical as other places. You, you have to understand that that's certainly true. Um, and that takes a level of expertise that goes beyond what a, a town board would ever have to do. Uh, they would have to contract that out. Um, but I think um, the state should be <laughs> helping. Any last chat questions? As I used to tell my students, you can run wild and free at this point. Wow, that's great. They're not doing rotations very well. No, I'm just curious about. Yeah. I'm just curious about the numbers. I should be repeating them. I'm sorry. Well, thank you very much. Yes. All right. Well, good luck to you all. It's a challenge, but it's really worth the effort. Come to Bob's presentation tomorrow night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how that goes. There's a big thing to do. Capital letter. Applause? We don't need applause.